Hello, everyone. Good day, good morning, and good afternoon to all of our guests and participants from around the country today. My name is Angela Payne, and I'm the board president for Alina in Canada. And behalf of our entire organization comprised of our board of directors, our chapters in Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto, as well as the hundreds of volunteers who help us deliver events like these, we are super excited to kick off our session today entitled Pay Equity, the Relevance and Strategic Importance in a COVID World. Our organization is over 8,000 women strong, one of the biggest networks in the Lean In worldwide community. And our mission of helping women to achieve their ambitions and create an equal world is always centered to our Canadian programming. Our vision of where of wanting a world where people of every gender can pursue their dreams without bias and barriers that hold them back. Where girls grow up to be confident, resilient leaders. Where more women run companies and countries. We are driven by the belief that our society and economy would be better if women and girls were valued as equal to boys and men. Today, we're gonna to explore with Katie Ward, the commissioner of the Ontario Pay Equity Office, and a fireside chat with Robin Doolittle, who many of you may know has been doing some amazing investigative work on the power gap. And with our moderator today, Sagan Waldai, who is our board director of engagement. Welcome. This primer event will highlight its critical importance to Canada's economy and to our recovery more than ever. As women, working women, and society at large, we need to continue to learn about pay equity in Canada, the gender wage gap, and why it matters. There is still much work that needs to be done in order to make workplace equality a reality. And as COVID continues to threaten the hard won gains of women, this work has taken on even greater urgency, greater meaning for all of us. If women have any chance that we don't lose further ground, we need to keep the issue of gender equality at the top of the agenda, not just for today or for one month, but for the entire year. Our goal at Lean In Canada is to provide a platform, which we have the privilege of hosting and helping to foster continued dialogue. Our intention today is to provide you with a few tools that you can use to get you started on your journey hopefully as a pay equity champion. I have no doubt our speakers will inspire us. In some ways, we might be shocked by what we learn, maybe even frustrated, but I am confident that we will be more educated and fired up like I was along with the committee when we started this journey many months ago. So I also want us to consider the role and importantly, enable us to consider the role that we each can play in change, whether it's for yourself, your professional community of women, or your organization. We look forward to engaging with all of you. So I'm inviting you to use the chat and your reaction buttons. I know we all know how to use those uh, on Zoom to let us know what you're feeling and also what you're thinking. I also invite you to share if you hear a new idea or our spark to action or have an alternative and new way of thinking. Use the hashtag PayEquityLeanIn on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Lean in Canada. follow us. We'll be watching, sharing, and learning from each of you. All right, so let's continue. I'm thrilled and honored to introduce you to Katie Ward. Katie and I met when we were both only a few months into our respective roles and we immediately hit it off. And since we've been engaged with the Pay Equity Office and Katie's team to learn how and to collaborate and to bring knowledge and insights to our membership. The results starting now. Commissioner Ward is a seasoned executive whose career has been characterized by successful collaboration across private, public, and not-for-profit organizations in order to design and deliver inclusive economic growth strategies. Before joining the Pay Equity Commission in 2020, Katie Ward, Commissioner Ward, worked on implementing aspects of the federal government's feminist international assistance policy, where she increased women's participation in international trade, the labor market, as well as equitable participation of men and women in their local economy. Her expertise has taken her around the world, 
working with legislators to establish programs and legislation to support women-led micro and small businesses. She is a Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medalist, recognized for her work contributing to significant economic improvement in various Canadian cities. Commissioner Ward firmly believes that equity and inclusion are the foundation for sustainable economic prosperity. Welcome to our virtual stage, Commissioner Katie Ward. Angela, thank you so much for inviting our organization to participate in this event. And I am personally delighted to be joining your community. I'm gonna start by talking about the broader context in which the pay equity conversation resides, which is the labor market and the economy. So our office understands that the gender wage gap is a result of a whole host of complex, interconnected structural issues, including early childhood education, play and gender stereotyping, intersectionality, and other compounding factors. For our part, we focus on compliance with Ontario's Pay Equity Act, education, and outreach to close the gap. So prior to this event, Diana had sent in a question about pay equity and compensation strategy. I'm not going to get into compensation strategy and total rewards other than to say that paying your employees equitably is an effective way to build a high performing culture, as well as driving employee engagement and excellence. Uh, it's also the law in Ontario, Quebec, and soon to be in Canada for federally regulated employers. Uh, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island have pay equity legislation for the public sector, but not yet for private while Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia have no specific legislation on pay equity, but address pay discrimination through human rights legislation. Questions were also submitted in advance about individual concerns about possible pay equity problems within their workplace. I can't comment today on individual circumstances, but I encourage you to reach out to our office if you'd like to file a complaint, launch an investigation, or ask you about your specific case. What I will talk about today is the pay equity gap, as well as gender and equity inclusion more generally, because research has shown that equity and inclusion initiatives help actually to influence the closing of the gender gap. The Pay Equity Office is an agency of the Ministry of Labor, Training and Skills Development in Ontario, a ministry that is vital to supporting a vibrant and cared for workforce across the province. And I think all of us here today would agree that a significant contributor to an economy's well-being is employment, uh, employment that pays well and offers new opportunity for personal and professional self-actualization. Well, the pays well part is central to our work. We focus on women and work and inequalities that persist in the labor force based on the devaluation of work historically or typically done by women or worse, work that is stereotyped as women's work. So Adriana, to also answer your pre-submitted question, yes, the stereotype of women's work, both inside and outside of the home, and how society values that work, influences the gender wage gap. Our office addresses this by making sure that work of equal value is compensated for equitably within an organization. And so we're often asked, well, what does work of equal value mean, and how do you determine it? Well, without getting into the fine nuanced details of the Pay Equity Act, we look at and compare various job classes within an organization and determine the value that job provides through a gender neutral lens. So I'll give you an example. How can a company say that a janitor, which is a stereotypical, we could say male job, provides more value than a secretary, a stereotypical female job, and then pay the male janitor more than the female secretary? Well, they can't. When we look at the factors of skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions through a gender neutral lens using various methodologies like the job to job comparison or proportional value methodology, we can actually quantify the value of what a job brings to an organization and then determine if there is systemic devaluation of a job because it is held by a woman. If there is, we mandate that the wages of the underpaid job be adjusted. So right now there is a sense of urgency to our work as the twin economic and health crises we're experiencing have the potential to roll back gender equality and all the gains it has brought to our workforce. Up until the start of the pandemic, women's participation in the labor market in Ontario had increased dramatically over the past half century. And fueling this progress is a growing recognition that women's representation in the labor market has both social and economic benefits driving gender equality, 
workforce productivity, and increasing household income. McKinsey and Company's Global Institute report found that narrowing the gender wage gap could add between 12 and 28 trillion to the global GDP. Of course, private sector employers see this as a cost to their bottom line and resist it. What they don't see is the cost of an equitable compensation and the lack of gender equity to their productivity. Since 2015, McKinsey has also been documenting the impact of including and excluding women in 1,000 organizations across 15 countries. Their report notes that companies with gender diversity were 25% more likely to experience above average profitability than their peer companies without it. So not recognizing or compensating ideas fairly because they're delivered by a woman is actually detrimental to innovation, value creation, and a company's bottom line. So that was a macro look at some of the economic and labor market context that shapes the pay equity and inclusion conversation. I now want to talk a little bit about the micro aspect, the individual in the company. Soon we'll have the exceptional opportunity to hear from Robin Doolittle on her investigative series, The Power Gap. And this series leverages data to provide an undeniable narrative on the wage and power gaps across our nation. Perhaps more importantly, though, the personal stories of Gabriela Sefcikova, Jeanette Zavo, Dr. Noni McDonald, Janelle Benjamin, and others give depth and meaning to the data that help us understand the tacit ways in which women are excluded from power and equitable compensation. Throughout my career, I've heard countless similar stories. I've also been lucky enough to witness the other side of these stories, the transformative side when women are included and recognized equitably. Before joining the Pay Equity Office, I worked in international economic development, focusing on women's participation in the political and economic life of their communities. And I had the opportunity to work with the team who led the Bryant Park restoration in New York City. It was a squalid, crime-ridden park that was transformed following 10 long years of investment. So I asked, what was the turning point? The answer, women. When women made up at least 55% of the park patrons, crime dropped, cleanliness and patronage increased. So what I learned in that park was that when a woman walks her child down the street, she signifies to everyone else, the street is safe, that it belongs to her. And her inclusion is a powerful magnet. Her presence signals others to join. So when women participate equally and are recognized for their contributions, societies and organizations flourish. I would add to this that when women are included in the story or better are the storytellers, the narrative changes. And the narrative is changing right now through the stories uncovered in Robin's work and the stories we tell ourselves and talk about with each other daily. Storytelling is deeply meaningful and is critical to human culture. It binds us together, teaches children, diffuses conflict, eases pain and shares joy. So to say that women talk too much or tell too many stories is to belittle the purpose and wisdom of emotionally intelligent conversation. From boardrooms to bleachers to media panels, men often dominate conversations, interrupt and mansplain. You've likely experienced this yourself, afraid to speak up in a meeting or to contradict a male colleague, and yet women are accused of talking too much and then punished for it. And Mila asks this question in advance, if the wage gap exists because men are rewarded for being more aggressive and women are rewarded for being more agreeable, or Mila, that is one of the broader social cultural compounding factors related to the wage gap. In fact, a study published by Yale University found that among chief executives, Male executives who spoke more than their peers received 10% higher competency ratings for colleagues. However, female colleagues who spoke more than their peers were rated by both genders as 14% less competent. Due to the widespread culture of sidelining and silencing women, it's perhaps unsurprising that women are less likely to speak up and negotiate their salary and benefits than men. This is an often cited but completely unacceptable factor related to the wage gap. Okay, so what does talking and storytelling have to do with pay equity? Well, over the past few years, even in my lifetime, women have increased the range of where we talk, what we talk about, and the fields we contribute our knowledge to. So I was born in the 1900s. It sounds like a long time ago, but it's not. And in the beginning of the 1900s, women were not considered persons in Canada. It wasn't until 1927 that we were included in the legal definition opening the opportunity for us to participate in public, economic, and political discourse. So I can't help but imagine how women's contributions would have been valued if women were considered persons before 1927 and their stories were told from their point of view. If Eve's hunger for knowledge was celebrated rather than cast as the fall of man. 
If Cleopatra's ascendance to the throne was framed as the result of astute strategy and negotiation skills, rather than being dismissed as the luck of a temptress. If Joan of Arc had not been burned for wearing men's clothing, but recognized for, as an equal for the successful military, military campaign she led. If the scientific community hadn't waited a century to pay attention to Ada Lovelace's notes on Charles Babbage's engine. And well, there are way too many women to name here, but if women running for government hadn't been judged by their hair and pantsuits, but rather the substance of their platforms. I could go on, but it's clear. Men's voices on women's stories lead to distorted and equitable truths about the value of our contributions and our worth. So here's a story we've been told since women started making progress towards gender equality. It's going to take 100 years to close the gender wage gap. And recently, the World Economic Forum, a primarily male establishment, estimated that it would take 257 years to achieve economic equity between men and women. Is that true, considering the progress that has already been made? Since 1997, every single province across Canada has decreased the gender wage gap by 6 to 13 percent. New Brunswick currently has the lowest wage gap measured at 7.4% in 2018. So no doubt all of you right now want to see the numbers for each of your provinces and we're going to share them with you in the chat so you can compare by province. But do you think that focusing on what hasn't been achieved serves to perpetuate the idea that gender and wage equity cannot be achieved? I do. I believe it sets a sort of fatalism that normalizes the wage gap and the status quo. Let's not normalize the current structures, but rather let's transform them. So my children can say, I was born in the 2000s. And in the 2000s, we eliminated gender discrimination and achieved, achieved pay equity. So this brings me back to talking and storytelling. Part of the process to achieve equity and inclusion is to reclaim and tell our stories of accomplishment and articulate our worth. There is a long way to go and we know that. And yet progress is being made. Robin recently reported on the giant baby steps Canadian law firms are taking to uncover, examine, and correct gender wage gaps within their firms. And as the title of one of her articles suggests, on the long road to pay equity, even the baby steps count. Even the baby steps need to be celebrated because you elevate the baby steps and they become leaps. To support closing the wage gap, we need to talk and tell more stories, not just about the problems, but also about the progress. For instance, Ontario was the first government globally to pass a Pay Equity Act. And in 1997, the gender wage gap in both Canada and Ontario was at 18%. In Ontario, it last measured at 12.2 in 2018, with the Canadian average at 13.3. Progress is being made incrementally, not only as a result of the Pay Equity Act as a legislative tool, but also as a result of several key stakeholders advocating for various tools and programs to address wage inequity, bias, and stereotypes that devalue women at work. So we don't need to read the reports to know that women at work and women at home have been dis disproportionately affected through the start of the pandemic. In April 2020, women's employment dropped to 55%, the lowest it's been since the 80s. And yet, never in my lifetime have I read and seen so many stories about women in work and so many reports looking at the economics of inequity. Over the past year, we have coined the term she session, she covery, with governments and agencies talking about a feminist post COVID recovery. Just yesterday, the federal government tabled its 2021 budget, a document that mentioned women no less than 665 times. All told, 34% of investments proposed in budget 2021 are expected to benefit women specifically. This includes a Canada-wide early learning and childcare system, which will directly create jobs for women and support women's labor market participation and the responsibility as caregivers. Ontario recently established a task force on inclusive economic growth with a mandate to address unique disproportionate barriers facing women. So governments are paying attention and there's an opportunity to capitalize on the singular moment in time. Let's keep the conversation going so policymakers at both the federal and provincial levels continue to enforce and create legislation or programs that address women's economic justice and support closing the wage gap. If your province does not have a specific policy tool or program to address this, gather your colleagues, consult with stakeholders, talk about and propose a solution. If your province does, then learn how you can promote it and provide feedback that could make it more effective. 
The team at the Pay Equity Office is committed to this and to ensuring women's economic empowerment through enforcement of our act, the first of its kind globally, and through education that edifies and elevates the equity conversation. We're grateful for partners like Lean in Canada and institutions like the Globe and Mail with writers like Robin Doolittle, whose leadership in looking at and talking about the pay equity gap demonstrates that the future need not replicate the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. We are super excited to hear those stories. I mean, I, I don't know, I know I can see the comments already in the chat and just the, the level of uh, the way these stories resonate are just, just next level. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to welcome Robin to the stage here for our fireside chat. I think it's gonna be a really exciting session. Um, hey Robin. So Robin is uh, Robin Doolittle is a member of the Globe and Mail's investigative team and is a two-time winner of Canada's Mission Award. Since coming to the Globe in 2014, she has probed suspicious co business contracts, political corruption, and Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Her unfounded investigation, which explored the ways that Canadian uh, po police services handle sexual assault cases, prompted a national overhaul of the policy, training, and practices around sexual violence. That series was awarded a National Newspaper Award for investigative journalism, among many other honors, including two others, two awards at the International Online Journalism Awards. Her latest book, called Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Hashtag Me Too, was shortlisted for the RBC Taylor Prize for nonfiction. Robin was also named Journalist of the Year in 2017, if nothing else, among her many accomplishments. So Robin, welcome to the stage. We're super excited to have you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> so I'm going to kick things off by by just asking right off the bat, what led you to investigate the gender pay gap uh, and ultimately the power gap? So this all goes back to 2018. Uh, I was just finishing my Unfounded series, which you mentioned, and was looking at what my next project might be. I was also uh, about to take a maternity leave. Uh, this was a couple months after Me Too. And there was a story coming out of the UK, uh, legislation that had just passed there had compelled the BBC to release the salaries of its journalists. And a number of prominent female journalists realized that they were being dramatically, like I think it was six figure kind of dramatic, uh, underpaid compared to their male colleagues doing the exact same work. And, you know, in the wake of Me Too, when the, the conversation had kind of evolved beyond sexual harassment, and sexual violence to broader issues of equity. Um, this is what I was thinking about. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we've all heard the statistic that women make something like 87 cents for every dollar that a man makes. I wanted to know, okay, that's the overall average of hourly wages. What's the guy next to me with the same education, the same experience, doing the same job making? Is, is he more than me? And I think that that's what I think a lot of women wanna know. And that's how this started. It was an effort to really look at um, the, 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 the wage gap for specific jobs. The problem, of course, is that all of this is secret. Uh, so that's why we focused in on the one segment of the, uh, the workforce that's where this is public, and that's high income earners in the public sector. So we took Sunshine List from across the country, we married it with statistics around the gender probability of first names, and we came up with the power gap. And what we found in the data was that while wages were still an issue, the bigger story was just the lack of women, the lack of women earning six figures, the lack of women in various management job titles, the lack of, lack of women at the top, but also the lack of women in the middle, the pipeline they were dropping out well before uh, the senior leadership roles. And that's where we ultimately realized that calling this a gender wage gap wasn't really hitting the issue as much as as looking at the many ways that women were being held back in the workforce and continue to be today. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who, who maybe aren't familiar, the Sunshine List is a publicly listed, you know, uh, salary reporting for public sector roles uh, over, over, I think it's 100K or something. So it's definitely... different in every province, but it's about six figures. And for yeah. our, for our purposes, we equalized everything. So it would be yeah. comparable. Yeah. Every, every province except PEI, New Brunswick, the territories and the federal government produce some yeah. form of public sector salary disclosure. Yeah, exactly. So I guess as you started this, what were you hoping to achieve through the reporting? Oh, geez, what were they hoping to achieve? Um, I mean, I don't know if I 
think of it in, in that way as much as I have a question and I want to find the answer. And mm -hmm. as so often happens, the, the story kind of pushes you in different directions. As I mentioned, we veered away from just looking at wages into the broader issue. Um, you know, I listened to, to uh, Katie's report and it was great. And I don't mean to be a bummer. I'm going to be a bit of a bummer here, though. Uh, when she's talking about like she hates the fatalistic narrative because I totally understand that. But I think for me in my reporting, what I found was um, actually it is a bit of a bummer. Like we are not making great progress. And I think that people are kind of complacent about how slow things are going. The wage gap has been closing, but one of the primary drivers of that is that men's wages are going down in the lower salary echelons. Like it's not that women are suddenly skyrocketing ahead. I mean, I'm not saying that there hasn't been some improvement, but it's it's really slow. Like the number of women, so we I interviewed something like 50 different, 50 different women who have encountered significant gender barriers in the workforce. We've all encountered barriers here, but I'm talking about like how to get a lawyer involved significant. And so many of them, you know, were getting towards the end of their career and said, you know, I cannot believe that we are still talking about this. In the 80s, in the 90s, I was told, you know, oh, this is a pipeline problem. Okay, that, that's why this hasn't been solved yet. And uh, here we are, I'm about to retire, and it's still a problem. And that's what the data showed, is it is a pipeline problem. Uh, women's careers are stalling out in mid-level management. And of the few who do get through, they're almost entirely white. We looked at the top 1% of earners uh, and everyone who ran different entities with our public sector salary data, data set. There were something like 1,100 people in that group and 27 were women of color. So, I mean, that's a like spit out your coffee number to me. Um, and I think if you talk about what I'm trying to achieve, I think it's, I want to like, um, scream from the top of the mountain that uh, we need to pay attention to this and 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 um, and again like I there's always so much focus on the number of women on boards the number there's a new women CEO let's put her on the front of a magazine but we're missing the fact that like the middle has not changed I don't want to scoop myself here but one of the things that we're doing right now that we're just this story is in editing but we looked at the sunshine list over 20 years and in, in, in many cases, like the, the one sector we're looking at, the wage gap in universities is increasing. The, the wage gap has increased. Can I scream that again? Um, whether you adjust for inflation or not. So I, I think what the real message here is, is that um, I think the narrative that things are better is, is true, but they are dramatically not as good as they could be or should be. Especially given the amount of time we spent on this, right? Yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to sort of the, for those in the audience, for example, who haven't read the series, can you maybe summarize the findings of, of what your analysis sort of shared or showed? Yeah, there's so many different things. I mean, one of the things, um, it, it's a challenge with reporting on this series, like my unfounded series, which is sexual assault, focused on a specific statistic, the number of complaints that were thrown out as false or baseless, one in five, easy. It's a, it's, I can say it in a sentence, okay? I couple that with anecdotes, here you go. It's a really easy to understand issue. Gender discrimination and discrimination in general is, is really complicated. It's complex. Um, looking at the gaps are, are, uh, are challenging. So what we did was we took, there was something like 244 entities across the country that we looked at and we sliced and diced it all different ways. Uh, we focused on four key pillars because they had the most influence on our day-to-day -day lives and because the data was the cleanest. So we looked at universities, we looked at large cities, we looked at public and crown corporations. So these are places that like, if you're in Ontario, like Metrolinx, the LCBO, they run your lottery. If you're in the prairies, they often are involved in um, telecoms, fraud regulations, securities commissions, et cetera. Those are crown corporations or public corporations and then the core government. And uh, so we looked at the overall trends in each area, each of these pillars, as we call them. And then we took each individual workplace and we sliced it and diced it down into either five or 10 salary bands, depending on the number of workers who met the six figure threshold. Um, we looked at the executive teams, the key leaderships, we looked at the people at the very top. Um, and then we also did keywords based on uh, specific job titles. So if you're a manager, a general manager, a supervisor, a director, an executive director, uh, a vice president. 
And what we found was that by basically every measure, women were outnumbered and outranked and outearned. So if you looked at people who held the manager title, um, and we were really careful to try to just pick people who were just listed as manager, not like manager and something else to try to make it as apples to apples. Um, the gap wasn't huge, but there were many more men and they tended to make overall more than the women. And this was just true, like pretty much everywhere. I think something like, I should have checked this before we did this, but something like of the 204 places, I want to say something like, like 27 had more women overall among six figure earners. Like it's just dramatically skewed in one direction. Yeah. I mean, it, it's crazy given the history of the research in this space too. I mean, obviously not to that level, but even the existing research, some of this is, is, you know, I, I hear it and I'm like, I'm, I'm not surprised. Was there mm -hmm. anything for you that as you went through the research was super surprising? Yeah. So there's a data component to this. And then, as I mentioned, I interviewed and I investigated That's specific crazy. cases. The thing mm -hmm. that really got me was, um, I did not realize that every day in this country, women are being fired after telling their employers that they're pregnant. Like we have laws, we have all the laws we could possibly dream to prevent gender discrimination, racial discrimination, discrimination against people with disabilities, LGBTQ plus, um, they're almost impossible to enforce. There is no like proactive person going out and checking on like, are you um, going into your business? Can you show me your books? Um, have you fired anyone who's been uh, there's, like, who's reported pregnancy? How's your promotions going? Like that doesn't exist. It's all, if someone has to, if you encounter an issue, you have to complain. Okay, where do you complain? These cases, the, the, the court body that was set up to handle discrimination uh, complaints, the human rights tribunals, um, all the provinces have them. They are dramatically underfunded across the country. In some cases, governments are actively removing adjudicator positions. So they're, they're short staffed. The wait time just to get a hearing is between two and four years on average. I encountered cases that went 10 years, spoke to many uh, employment lawyers who tell me it is not uncommon for a woman to file a complaint about being fired uh, while they're pregnant or being demoted while they're pregnant and to not get a decision until the kid is in school. So this is two to four years here. The damages are almost always between five and $20,000 and they don't pay your lawyer fees if you win. So if you've hired a lawyer, because if you're going after a bigger company, they are hiring a lawyer, how much of that money is going to go to them? What's the result? Who is going to sign up for that? Because we all know if you raise your hand and say like, I'm being discriminated against because I'm a woman, like, how's that going to go for you internally in your company? So what happens is people either um, quit and go somewhere else, or if the relationship is so toxic that they end up often signing a, um, a mutual release that there, there is a settlement, like go on your way, good luck. Oh, and by the way, here's a confidentiality clause. Um, and so you can't talk about what happened to you and we don't have to fix it. The number of lawyers that I spoke to who said it is actually cheaper to discriminate and pay the measly fines, whether it's issued through a court fine or whether it's in a settlement, it's actually, it's actually cheaper to discriminate. So that was the thing that just really knocked me off my chair was that, um, oh yeah, like where, what do you do if you're encountering discrimination in the workforce? So that's an area when we talk about like, what can we fix? Like this needs major reform. Yeah, that's, I mean, sh shocking. Yeah, I have to, I, I would like to believe that we are protected enough, especially here in Canada, we're fortunate enough to live in Canada to be protected, but hearing that is pretty, uh, pretty damning. It's not. It is. And sure. when you think about, you know, Ontario became the first province that, that made it illegal to pay right. someone a um, uh, different uh, salary based on gender alone. And that was, I think, passed in um, something like, I think it was 1951. Like it was mm -hmm. a long time ago. It has been illegal uh, to discriminate based on promotion in Ontario or firing or hiring based on gender since the 19, early 1970s. Um, the pregnancy discrimination has been illegal since again, the 1970s reinforced by court decisions through the eighties. So this is like, this is, this is a long one battle theoretically that, that is still struggling here. And that I think part online. of it is that we didn't know, like I didn't mm -hmm. notice until I started looking at it. Yeah. 
So, I mean, you know, when a report like that comes out, there there has to be some sort of response. How, how did the public sector and these corporations respond and, and did they change any of their policies and practices? In response to the, the power gap series? Right. Yeah. So actually just, you know, we're still rolling here. So the first part was we looked at the public sector and then we're doing kind of deep dives into specific sectors. So we did the legal community and this was, I thought, like real, um, just kind of the things you hope for when you're doing journalism. Um, we uh, was so again, legal is not is a private sector um, yeah. entity. These big Bay Street law firms, but I was able to um, view uh, highly confidential internal pay information, and we ran a report that noted that female partners, equity partners at a major uh, Bay Street firm, were making twenty five percent less than their male colleagues. Um, that's two hundred thousand dollars in Bay Street money, two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars per year of your career. So like, let's compound that over. And uh, after that story came out, um, subsequently, uh, another firm, uh, well, firms across the country, the, the 25 largest, 20 of them have now agreed to release wage gap data um, to a professional uh, research body. This is something that firms in the US and the UK already do. Canadian firms had always refused to do it. And one firm, Aird and Bearless, actually agreed to share their data with the globe. And one really encouraging thing, so this is something we can get excited about, is they had a 17% wage gap among equity partners, but they found that if they looked at the lawyers who had only been practicing for 20 years or less, the women actually made slightly more. And that reinforced this idea that at least at this firm, this was a problem that could be corrected moving forward. So right. um, that's a, you know some great stuff from the, the um, legal sector, because I think transparency ultimately is huge. And then in yesterday's federal budget, we saw $172 million uh, from the federal government dedicated to better um, data collection from StatsCan, and it cited the, the Power Gap series, which was great because like this series from the Globe took two years, um, a team, like a, a large team, it costs many hundreds of thousands of dollars to put together. And ultimately this is data that we should just have access to. So again, I think right now I'm really beating the, the transparency drum. Like we need to uh, have more information uh, so that we can combat this problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I'm getting pinged here that we're running out of time a little bit and I <laughs> wanna make sure we have time for Q&A, but I guess maybe I'll leave you with one last question. Uh, what's, what's next for you? You've given us a bit of a scoop in terms of uh, some work you have in the pipeline, mm-hmm. but where does your research and advocacy go from here? Um, so it's tricky. I definitely do things, uh, do types of reporting that um, have, uh, I'm interested in social justice issues. I wouldn't call myself an advocate though. It's a tricky little, uh, like, it's not, it's a, it's a little line in journalism land, but um, so it's power gap series all year long. Uh, we're just about to do universities. Uh, we have not for profits coming up um, and then the medical uh, sector, which is especially timely with COVID. So that's kind of the plan for the rest of the year. After that, I have no idea. Do you guys have any ideas for the next investigation? I don't know. Maybe they'll submit it in the chat. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> um, no, I mean, this is incredible. I, I feel like I've got already a ton of questions already swirling through my good. mind. I, hope, so I, I don't want to be a bummer, but although I think it's good to have the two because there are good oh, things good. and there yes. are bad things and we can like balance yeah. we can, and, we can and perfect timing. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, no, I think that's perfect. And with that in mind, I actually, uh, I think this has just been so good and so, so uh, insightful when it comes to just the time and research you spent towards this research and I can only see hopefully the the response leading to some some real change in these, in these organizations. We sure hope so, at least. Um, so I know we're wrapping up the fireside chat, but I do want to welcome back Katie uh, to for, for the Q and A for the Q and A period here. Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah. And uh, I think you know we've gotten a couple questions here, so I'm I'm gonna be sort of running with the questions being submitted. I'll do my best. Um, but maybe we'll start with just a uh, question to you, Katie. Robin's investigative study looks at the power and wage gap across Canada. What pay equity tools exist nationally and provincially other than Ontario's act to, to address these issues? Yeah, and uh, as Robin explained, she looked at the, the information available at the provincial level. And so um, we're obviously a provincial agency of the government. So, um, you know, as I stated in, in my talk, currently the only other province with a Pay Equity Act that's enforceable is um, the province of Quebec. The federal government is currently in the process of putting into force the Federal Pay Equity Act, but of course it's going to only focus on um, federally regulated employers. So different jurisdictions treat pay equity 
um, or talk about and address pay equity differently. They may look at it through a Pay Equity Act or other tools. So Manitoba, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI um, have in fact created pay equity legislation, but only for the public sector and not it's not applicable yet or they're not enforcing it into the private sector. Um, and as I mentioned, while Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia have no specific legislation, but they address discrimination through human rights. But I did see a great comment here. Somebody said the Human Rights Commission hasn't been funded for 20 years in British Columbia. So that creates a significant um, challenge, obviously. So the, I, I think that you know, different jurisdictions figure out what's going to work for their constituents and what's going to work with their um, they're already sort of like super stew of policy tools that they have related to pay equity. And so for the jurisdictions that don't have it or where it's not effective, I think lean in can be a powerful community and the work Robin's doing can be like leveraged and taken and show because, um, you know, journalist doesn't want to do the advocacy. That's great because they need to have the credit to do the research, but we can do the advocacy or your community can do the advocacy. So I think the tools that are out there um, need to work with what the provincial government already has in place in their sort of policy soup um, and need to address the constituents. And, you know, we have an opportunity, this community through your circles, to drive the conversation of, of how governments uh, can create and launch those tools if they don't already have them. Yep, absolutely. love that. We've got another question here, too, that says... Um... What about uh, paternity leave? I see several women on middle, middle, in middle management positions that decide to leave or stay um, because workload is higher and, and more intense and they don't have the support at home, uh, especially when they start to grow a family. Um, is there a focus on, on paternity leave and finding that equality there? Uh, I mean, I, I think one of the biggest things that we need to do is get men on board with this. And I think... Um, I think it's really important to reinforce that the patriarchy is alive and well in all of us and the patriarchy hurts men too. The, uh, the current status quo uh, assumes men are less committed and love their children less, right? Like there is research that shows that men who take uh, paternity leave are viewed um, more negatively, right? Like men have a heart, can, can, can actually, uh, my colleague Tim Collads wrote an amazing story about this, that um, just the challenges he's, um, he's uh, married to a man, they have two children and just his partner uh, who works in, in business, uh, there was a, there's a lot of stigma about taking time off. Um, that's just one of the ways that the, that the status quo hurts men, um, including the fact that there's research that shows that male leaders who ask for help are viewed as less competent, like, oh my God, isn't that terrifying that male leaders are incentivized not to ask for help, that men who exhibit traits such as like, um, empathy are viewed as are, are paid less than their their male or are compensated less than their male colleagues who don't like this is a big problem so uh parental leave is absolutely huge and uh the other thing that i'll say that when i say the patriarchy is alive and well of all of us alive and well in all of us is just acknowledging as women too that like we have been so we've all been socialized this way right like i know that i am harder on my female bosses I know that I absolutely, when I view a woman politician, I'm like, oh, her voice is kind of like naggy. Like, of course I don't want to think this, but it is like a knee jerk reaction. And I think we all need to also acknowledge that, um, that we do, that, that we participate in this system as well. And it doesn't help if women who claw their way through the pipeline get to the top and then just reinforce the mm -hmm. same stuff that we've been that we've been doing all along right it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman it's um it, it's about actually like changing this system of what we value in in people and leaders and the type of work that we do so to get all the way back to your point that i completely veered off into the side parental leave is crucial it's not just offering it, but it's making it okay and acceptable and in fact valued for men to take it. My husband is a teacher. We split my, my, our, our leaves. We did six months and six months. And in fact, actually with our, my second child, he took more of the leave because of work stuff that I had going on. But in teaching, which is a female dominated profession, it's not like anyone gave him side eye for that. But I'm fully aware that if he worked in something like on Bay Street, he would have been. And that's a major problem, right? Because you're working together as a family unit. I need him to succeed. I need his employer to think he's killing it. So I don't want him 
to, uh, sorry, I know I'm rambling here, but like, I don't want him to have, you know, his boss being upset with him either. I interviewed a woman early on uh, for this, for the series, who was a senior manager at a very large bank. Um, and she had to step away from her job because she was watching kids at home with homeschooling and her employer, basically her boss basically said to her, like, you really need to think about maybe taking a leave because you don't want your, how distracted you are right now to show up on your performance reviews going forward. And why can't your husband help? And she said, you know, it's not a choice of whether my husband can help or not. He makes a dollar 70 for every dollar that I make. Like we need his salary to pay my, our mortgage. So um, yes, to parental leave, but also to normalizing men taking parental leave. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. This is something that's definitely close to home for myself. I think about it a lot as I, as I start to think about kids in the future too. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, maybe a question for you. What should women do to advocate for themselves? Well, that is a great question. I do want to add something on the parental leave. Because sure, sure, please. That, yes. um, the wage gap often cited is, is maternity leave. And they and it's a, it's one of those like not acceptable excuses for the wage gap because they say, oh, well, women opt out to like they take two years off to raise children. So it's their fault. Right. So it's pushing back that idea that we deserve this because we have decided to do something else. So um, this is where, you know, we're we're starting to do research in this um, area ourselves at the pay equity office to better understand the impact parental leaves has on closing the gender wage gap to to keep women in the workforce or to enable them, which goes back to the point of just normalizing that parental leave is something meaningful. Um, so women can advocate themselves in a, for themselves in a number of ways. And, and I talked about how this is, and Robin echoed it as well, all these issues are very complex and interconnected. So there's not one thing that's going to close the wage gap. It's not just going to be one piece of legislation or one set of tools. It's going to be uh, a way that we structurally think about women and their worth and their contributions. And so this is why part of my message was to encourage women to think about their worth and to think about what they're contributing that adds value and to find the ability to speak and share that and negotiate. There is a lot, I, I see people posting, a couple of consultants posting about their their um, their skills and their businesses that actually help women learn to negotiate. Uh, women getting educated on employment standard acts, on pay equity acts, on human rights discrimination. I see so many questions from women that the the legislation exists. Like you can't get fired on maternity leave. You you can't get a demotion on maternity leave. It's it's the law. And I know that it's very the. Um, we've heard from Robin how complicated and difficult it can be for women to go down the path, but you need to know that there is a path for you to go down and there is a path for you to fight if you want to, or a path for you to demonstrate or start telling your stories. Like Robin's investigative series is almost, I hope in a good way, shaming businesses. Like it started with one or two. It started with, I remember with the law firms, Robin, like five saying, yeah, we'll share the numbers. And now it's 20. So that it, it starts, and I think businesses right now, the climate is responsive. So if we start following the paths that are available to us, the, the policy and legislative paths, the, the Employment Standard Acts, the Pay Equity Acts, the Human Rights Discrimination, and we start talking about these stories, like people will, this is part of it, is they will start to get embarrassed and they will respond like what we saw with the lawyers. It was tremendous to see the momentum build. And I think this is a moment where women can start leveraging those tools and see, you know, I'm an optimist, obviously. So I think we're going to see an, a, a wave and a shift in the way that, that we're taking seriously now, because there's just so many headlines. There's so many reports. There's lots of money going into desegregated data now. So it's going to be very hard to ignore it when you have the data that demonstrates it. And I think women's voices on top of that, just talking about it and, and, not so, so many times we experience discrimination and we don't share it we're embarrassed or we just go oh like whatever I'm home I'm, I'm done work now I'm going to forget about it but we need to talk about it we need to tell our managers we need to confront the people who are doing that um, but you have to find strength within yourself to do that first and I think it starts with understanding your rights understanding the paths available to you and then making choices um, and finding the support you need. And there's lots of groups like Lean In, like Moms at Work, like other groups that are forming around women to help them uh, find the path and find the people who can support them down the path. Can I just take one second quickly yeah, too and please. add this point? Because there's this uh, Supreme Court case um, 
it's called Safeway, Brooks v. Safeway. And this is just reinforcing that pregnancy discrimination is gender discrimination. I won't get into the whole thing, but it's like, it's a very pivotal case in pregnancy discrimination. And in making the ruling, the judge said something that I quote all the time, um, that those who bear children and benefit society as a whole, thereby should not be economically or socially disadvantaged, seems to bespeak the obvious. It is only women who bear children. No man can become pregnant. As I argued earlier, it is unfair to impose all the costs of pregnancy upon one half of the population. Um, I do wanna highlight that probably if that was written today, it would be a little more careful around um, only women can bear children because certainly there are transgender people who can bear children who don't identify as women. But the point being that the Supreme Court of Canada is saying one half of society should not bear the brunt of something that benefits all of society. What a poignant statement. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps perhaps a good place to close. I, I think, you know, just this talk has been eye opening. It's been, I mean, I thought I, as someone who's on the direct, on the, on the board of lean in, I thought I knew these things, but every, every time I attend a talk like this, I feel like my mind is blown yet again. So uh, Katie, Robin, I cannot thank you both enough. It's, it's been an incredible chat and, and I see the comments, please, please keep the conversation going. <laughs> I agree. Um, it is an amazing conversation. I will pass it on to, to Angela for our closing remarks, but I can't thank you both enough for your time and for your dedication to these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Sagan. Thank you uh, to Katie and, and to Robin. Um, I, you know, wow, wow, wow. Um, thank you uh, for being a part of our conversation today. Um, you know, really interesting insights and real talk, uh, I think, with both Katie and Robin. And from, my, from the chat, I can see that that really got us, uh, you know, all of us on the call today, you know, almost 300 women really, uh, and men and, uh, and uh, all the groups that were on the call today really um, fired up and starting this conversation. And, I, and I'll reiterate again, if, if women have a chance, you know, and, and then when we don't lose further ground, we really need to keep the issue of gender equality at the top of the agenda not just for one day, for one month, for the entire year. And I heard both of these guests, both Robin and Katie talk about transparency. So I wanna talk a little bit about what's next, right? So um, I love doing these events. The, the committee that put these together always says, so what and what's next? So this event is really the first in, in as a part of a six month series, um, which will capstone another event for us in September. So over the next four months leading up to our September event, we want to not only educate, but also to collaborate and have you join our community, right? Um, you know, consider joining us on this journey um, and uh, consider really uh, looking at and, and starting this, this off with us. So how can, you, how can you do that? First of all, you can do it in two easy steps. You can join our pay equity conversations. Lean In is driven by this idea of organic work and a community platform of circles. And pay equity conversations is a circle created by the Lean In National Group um, and is available if you go to the uh, link that you see here that's being posted in the chat, it will take you directly to the pay equity circle. If you're interested in joining that circle to keep the conversation going, we we will be hosting four monthly meetings, uh, sorry, monthly meetings over four months from May through August, led by our board team um, around some of the topics that have been uh, very uh, critical to what you've been asking, some of the questions that you've been asking, um, as well as follow us on all of our platforms because we want to continue to keep that conversation. And again, I can't stress enough. Um, I think I echo really what, what Robin and uh, Katie were both talking about, about that transparency. And that only works when all of us are committed to continuing the conversation uh, around uh, a change, um, you know, ideas into action. I believe that nothing ever happens on its own. I hope you're walking away inspired with insights and advice that you can share. And there are opportunities in our own lives where we can be change agents. So I wanna thank our speakers, Katie and Robin, as well as Sagan. Thank you uh, all who helped us navigate the conversation. I wish you a great day and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you.